Uh, one one thing is that since my retreat, I just I feel so much more relaxed about everything actually. So even if we have a few stops and starts with this recording, it's fine. So now it's time for everybody to relax. So just settling in and getting yourself as comfortable as you can. So remember to ask your body rather than tell your body what to do and how to sit. There's no magic meditation posture, unfortunately. Some people do try. They sit themselves in half lotus for six hours or for 12 hours without moving. But quite often they're the ones who disrobe in the end. Just too much tension, too much control. So gently closing your eyes and retaining the sense of spiritual friendship that you're connecting, tapping into, whilst also allowing those visual impressions just to to fade away and to gently move into the feeling part of the mind. The eyes of the mind that can sense physical experience, physical sensations such as the contact of your legs, your bottom, with the ground or with the chair. There might be texture there, maybe hardness, softness if you're sitting on a really comfy chair or a bed. You might notice the field of temperature whether your body's warm, parts of it may be cooler than others. I can notice my toes and my hands are a little bit cool from the wind just coming slightly in through the window. And other parts are warm. me. The place where the arms touch the sides of my body, there's warmth felt there in the armpits also. So just really getting interested in the experience of being embodied in physical form. And as you do this, feel free to make any adjustments. Especially if your limbs are pressing against each other or the clothing may be tight. Perhaps like me, your shoulders are a little bit tense and hunched forward. Just perhaps rolling them gently, giving them an invitation to relax, slide down your back. Freeing up the space around the neck. Perhaps opening the front of the chest. feeling up through the spine and checking that your head is well balanced on your neck. And your facial muscles are relaxed.
breathing. Allowing yourself to relax more fully with every out breath. Maybe taking a few deeper breaths and intentionally allowing yourself to relax. <sighs> Settling. Arriving. Relaxing. So after caring for our physical posture, we're going to give attention to our mental posture too. The sensations, the experiences that you're having now may be pleasant and agreeable. Others may be unpleasant, painful or disagreeable. That's just nature beyond our control. But what we can influence is the attitude of our mind. So even if the object is disagreeable, uncomfortable, see if you can find a comfortable posture for the mind. If you wish, it might help to imagine somebody who you really respect, perhaps even revere. Maybe a spiritual teacher, a member of the monastic Sangha. Or someone who has very beautiful, noble qualities of heart. See if you can just tune in to those qualities. Perhaps the patience the kindness, generosity or joy. The virtue, the renunciation. And imagine yourself holding up these qualities above your head or in front of your mind with love and reverence. As though you were taking out a very precious jewel and holding it to the light. So you can really examine, examine it closely, drink in its beauty with wonder, with awe.
And notice how the mind starts to incline, tune up, resonate with those qualities. As though there's a deep recognition of something inside of you. That you recognize, you revere, you love these qualities is your strength, your wisdom. your intuition, that this is what you want to nourish and cultivate in your own heart. See if you can open yourself to those beautiful qualities. Surrendering anything that's burdening you, holding you down. So that whatever arises in your body and mind, whether thoughts, sensations, or maybe the breath, they're suffused with these beautiful qualities of love, acceptance, patience, kindness.
And as the mind becomes quieter, just see if there's anything that you can abandon, anything you don't need. And have the courage to let go just a little bit more of striving or holding to any experience. Just basking in the warmth and light of the sun. In the same way, the daffodils gently turn their heads to the source of that light and warmth, away from the cold, dark, gloomy places. Towards the brightness kindness, the warmth of the sun.
relaxing <clears throat> as though you were that daffodil in the sunshine, receiving the warmth and the light that is the kindness and the mindfulness. And trusting that kindness, that awareness to allow your lotus flower to open up. So we're coming close already to the end of the meditation. I'd just like to invite you to again reconnect with that person or those qualities that you began this meditation reflecting upon. Noticing if that brings any uplift in your heart. And noticing if you too have inclined a little bit more closely toward those beautiful ennobling qualities that you hold with such respect in reverence and in awe. Perhaps you've developed a little bit more kindness, softness. Your mind feels more open, more relaxed. And noticing too, if there's still things you're holding on to. which cause you to suffer. Without judgment, just noticing the effect of whatever we we're aware of. Recognizing that we do have some influence on how we incline our mind. So just thanking yourself 
for this gift of meditation. This time to tend and care for the heart. When you're ready in your own time, if you wish, you can open your eyes. <laughs> so Not sure everybody knows what a daffodil is actually. Do you all know what a daffodil is? I have a nice little daffodil on my um, outside in the courtyard and I notice how it moves its head towards the sun. And if the sun's high up, it looks high up. And if the sun goes down, it's kind of, <laughs> it's very sweet to watch. It's like a yellow trumpety sort of flower, bright yellow, really beautiful springtime in England and probably for most of us here I think. I think the Australians are well and truly fast asleep right now so <clears throat> we're all in a similar time zone even in uh, America I guess it's springtime coming soon although it's a bit colder in uh, some parts of America they still have a lot of snow and even go skiing cross-country skiing at this time of year. <laughs> Good, so I wanted to talk about the Sangha and I sort of call this talk in reverence to the Sangha, I guess because that was a really sort of powerful feeling that arose for me during my retreat. Um, because really to meet people on the path who have walked that bit further can really bring so much inspiration to our own practice. For me, it brings the Dhamma alive. You know, it brings the message of the Buddha alive because although the Buddha, we can read about him in the text, we can't actually go and meet the Buddha in person anymore, but we can evoke the qualities of the Buddha and the Dhamma and Sangha in our heart. And in that sense, we can associate with these noble beings, right? But my retreat was particularly inspiring because I did have very, um, very enriching uh, conversations with my teacher and uh, it really seemed to fill up the sort of inspiration tank. Sometimes I think when we're very busy in life, you know, running around and trying to do a lot of service or not really running, but sort of more typing, um, things can become a little bit uh, yeah, a little bit mundane. And of course, I always have the purpose of why I'm doing this very clearly in my mind, but to reconnect with it on retreat and to really, you know, bring all the conversation back to the Dhamma and to the beauty and, and potential of that Dhamma was incredibly inspiring. So I just felt overflowing with joy and gratitude, you know, to be in contact with my teacher and also to be a member of the monastic Sangha um, and to be part of something so much bigger than myself. So I wanted to talk about um, how reflecting on things like the Sangha can inspire and motivate our practice and bring a lot of confidence in the path. So of course, the, um, the Buddha said to the Venerable Ananda, many of you might know this sutta, where the Venerable Ananda, who was his chief attendant said, oh, I was thinking about this. I was really inspired, you know, by, by you as my teacher and by this idea of a Sangha. And I was thinking that spiritual friendship must be the whole of the, sorry, half of the holy life, right? Half of the spiritual life. I guess he was thinking that the other half is, you know, the practice and, you know, making an effort and all of that sort of thing. But the Buddha said, don't say that, Ananda. The spiritual friendship is actually the whole of the holy life, the whole of the spiritual life, which is incredibly 
strange and also a very powerful thing to say, right? Because surely a lot of it depends on ourselves. Surely it depends on my effort, my will, my qualities, my capacity, my potential. But what the Buddha is saying here is that it depends on spiritual friendship more than anything else. And there's a little sutta that uh, goes a bit further, the same sutta. Um, so I wanted to read out what he next says, because not many people read this part. So how come spiritual friendship is the whole of the holy life? And the Buddha said, when a monastic has a good friend, a good companion or a good comrade, it is to be expected that they will develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. So that's why. So it does involve practice, but the fact is that if you have that input, if you have that inspiration, that guidance, somebody sort of overseeing your training on the path and giving you that um, example to emulate, then it's almost inevitable. Well, it is inevitable, he's saying here, that you will cultivate the, four, the Eightfold Noble Path. So that's quite amazing, isn't it? And of course, this is what happens when you come across truly noble beings. And we can't always say for sure that we know who they are. Um, one of our monastic rules is not to talk about attainments, right? So nobody will a genuinely um, developed or humbled, let's say, person will never say, I am a such and such, I am enlightened, or even I get into jhanas, you know, they just don't speak like this because the sense of self has been seen through. They understand this is just cause and effect. And these are things that happen when the self gets out of the way. So we can't be sure, but we can have confidence and trust. And sometimes that is, you know, a huge boost to our own practice. And I can certainly say it was to mine. So um, he goes on further here and, and says that um, the monk develops in this case, the monk, but the monastic or even the lay person can develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path due to that right friendship. And then at the end of this little sutta, the Buddha says, by relying upon me as a good friend, that's the Buddha himself, being subject to birth, are freed from birth, being subject to old age, are freed from old age, being subject to death, are freed from death, being subject to sorrow, lamentation, pain, dejection and despair are freed from those things. And by this method too, Ananda, it may be understood how the entire spiritual life is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. Yeah. So this I think is where the reverence comes in as well, because we're really understanding here that there is something to be experienced. There is something to be realized. And it isn't just the Dhamma that we practice to give ourselves a happier life. The profundity, the scope and the depth of the Dhamma is immense. And it's something most of us cannot even fathom at this stage on our path. You know, the potential that the Dhamma has to bring you out of all suffering and not only in this life, but in future lives as well, to bring you out of all sorrow, lamentation, and of course, death and rebirth, right? So we're talking about something really profound. And I think that when we start to intuit the profundity of this path, it brings a sense of humility. It brings a sense of awe and reverence. And the Buddha actually says without that sense of reverence, the Dhamma in this world will decline. So there's a sutta where he gives five reasons for the decline of the Dhamma and uh, yeah, the first three are a lack of reverence for the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, right? And in this case, we mean the monastic Sangha and also the, the noble beings. Yeah, the fact that there are such beings in the world and it isn't something small, right? Many of us have experiences on the path that we think are, you know, really life transforming. We've seen the sense of self, maybe we've experienced bliss and joy and love. But these might be just small, small, small glimmers of something that is yet to really mature and come to fulfillment. There are many experiences the mind can produce or the mind is capable of. Yeah, actually, the mind sometimes produces them also. You know, we can sometimes crave for certain things and almost make them happen, but we're just too involved for them to be the real thing. Yeah, and then that leads to more of a sort of inflation of the ego rather than a lessening of the sense of self. So the real genuine um, 
uh, realizations are actually happen when you get out of the way. Yeah. You have to, it's as though you're a battery full of rubbish, you know, you've been charged up with all this junk. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it feels like this, doesn't it, when we go and meditate, you sit down on your cushion and you're like, gosh, I've got this headache, I've got this worry, this concern, my stomach hurts because I ate too quickly or I ate the wrong food. And there's all these problems to fix. And I had experiences in my retreat where my stomach was really hurting and I had quite a lot of issues with, with that. And I'd sit down and, and think, okay, now I can kind of, you know, calm it down, make peace with it. Just, And it was really interesting because I realized at a certain point that I was still messing with it. I was still trying to fix it up. And what was actually needed was for all this stuff to just dissipate. It was though the battery needed to discharge, needed to discharge. So instead, when I realized I was doing this, I just stopped and completely made peace with it. And making peace is such a subtle thing to do because you're not actually making peace. You're just standing right back, sitting right back, almost like sitting underneath the mind. Yeah, You're like so much in the background, so uninvolved that the whole thing just starts to drain. And it's really interesting when you get this subtle shift that it drains very quickly and suddenly it's almost like you're being recharged, but with something much subtler and more beautiful in its place. So this happens, it has happened, you know, several, many times, I guess, during my practice life, but sometimes it can happen almost in an instant. For example, many years ago, I think it was in Belgium, I had an asthma attack and uh, I'd already done many years of yoga by then and managed to get myself off my inhalers and steroid inhalers and even trek to Ladakh. Um, but this was triggered by some kind of dust allergy. And so I was really struggling, but determined to use the meditation rather than my inhaler to come through this asthma attack. I think I was uh, either serving or sitting at an intensive retreat at the time. So my mindfulness was really strong. And, you know, I was very patient with it. I was ready to, you know, just experience that feeling of not being able to breathe. So I was lying there in my bed and it was sort of very uncomfortable. I mean, a lot of fear can arise when you simply can't get your breath, but I was keeping cool, keeping economous, letting it just, you know, be there. But it was about four hours on now. So it was about two in the morning or something. And I thought, yeah, I'm not gonna get any sleep tonight. <laughs> But then I just noticed that although I was scanning my body, I was getting stuck where that asthma, that tightest feeling would start. I was scanning most of it, but there was still, I mean, even though I was aware of the sensations in the most difficult part of my body, like the, the actual lungs, there was a tightness there in the awareness. There was still a little bit of contention with the experience. And as soon as I realized that, and I really allowed my mind to sink into that experience. It was, it was instant. It was as though all the cells, all the airways just opened up. And it was almost as though each cell of my body started to take in oxygen. And there was this sense of lightness that came right over me and all the channels were clear. I could breathe perfectly. And it was just gone like that, you know. And these are so interesting as experiences that tell us, you know, how we're getting in the way. We don't even notice that we're involving ourselves. We don't even notice that there's um, this negative relationship happening with what it is that's disagreeable. So real letting go means not just sort of trying to go around that experience and get to the place where the asthma attack stops, but it means actually really allowing your mind to be with it fully and completely open to it in a fearless and genuine way. So these kind of things are so um, interesting, you know, just as experiences. And I noticed the same thing this time when I was, you know, just contracting that little bit around my tummy problems and how, you know, just when I was able to sit back and trust the process, trust the Dhamma, trust my mind, right? Then all the bliss would just arise and, and the meditation would go to a completely different place. 
So the Buddha says, yeah, the five reasons for decline are the lack of reverence for the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So that's sometimes a lack of confidence, a lack of trust, but also a lack of reverence for the training and for samadhi, which is very interesting because this path is a path of training, you know, and that training is a lifelong thing. It's not something we can decide when we want to get results for it or when we're ready to start teaching or anything like that. You know, it's the Dhamma that decides. It's the Dhamma that takes you on a journey. You're not taking yourself along. It's not like you're hand in hand with me going on a little exploration. It's actually that you're relinquishing aspects of what you take to be a self, gradually just dropping them, putting them down, dropping them, letting them go letting them go and holding up these beautiful qualities of the noble ones in our mind, holding them up, you know, to the light so that we can really revere them. We can see that there's something there that I've yet to fully bring to fulfillment, but that I can intuit is the right way. You know, you have this sense with reverence. It brings a certain humility, a certain sense that you understand the depth and the profundity of this path. Yeah. It's not like any other learning where you go to school and you do the curriculum, then you're qualified. You know, we can't decide to do that. We have to let the Dharma work on us. And the beautiful thing about a Sangha is that that Sangha has all the safeguards, all the mentoring, the um, the kind of, uh, it's, it's a sort of holding field whereby your defilements gradually get rubbed down. The ego gradually gets diminished and you start to think more in terms of how can I benefit others you know and how can um, the Dhamma the Sangha work on me right so you go for refuge to the Sangha you go to refuge for the Buddha to the Dhamma but also to the Sangha you know and the Sangha don't have to be perfect I mean the Sangha as the Buddha explained it was actually the monastic Sangha um, he used the word parissa for the fourfold assembly. So there were monks, nuns, bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, right? Lay men and lay women. That was the fourfold assembly. Um, but the monastic sangha was what he was referring to. And I think this is because of the renunciation that's involved. Yeah. The signs of progress on the path are not, again, you know, how good you become at teaching or, you know, how many retreats you've done or how well you can explain things or anything like that. It's actually how much you've let go of, like, what are you able to relinquish, you know, and where are you getting stuck? And of course, as a monastic, you already relinquish things like your hair, (laughs) your old name, uh, you know, any kind of way of measuring yourself in in society's terms in a sense because you know to society we're just pretty useless right we go around with robes we're not economically productive in any way Um, we don't really fit in Um, so we relinquish these kind of things but they're the easy parts the difficult parts to relinquish are the parts which can even start to attach to the identity of being a non right You can just replace one identity with another (laughs) very easily. Or you can start to kind of get really, really interested in all your requisites. So it's like, oh, this monk's got a really fancy bowl for his, um, a bag for his arms bowl or whatever. He's got some lovely crocheted kind of bowl cover. I want one of those, you know, and then everybody has to have the same kind of. So even there, it's really tricky how the sense of self gets in. But because you're part of a Sangha, there's this beautiful safeguard of mutual admonishment as well. So Ajahn Brahm was just saying in a talk I heard recently that, you know, he started going teaching to huge audiences in Singapore from about 2004 or so, maybe even a little bit before then. Um, And I think he was pretty safe from danger by then, you know, otherwise he would have never um, thought to do such a thing. But he said, even so, when he walked out there, you know, and he saw this massive audience, he got this moment of what on earth am I doing here? This could be dangerous, this could be dangerous. You know, if there was any sense of a self, any sense that it's me giving this teaching, that all these people have come to see me, then that could have been a cause for his decline. You know, fame is one of the dangers for any monastic. Um, and the Buddha actually said it's, it's one of the most dangerous, even more than criticism and disrepute, right? It can really spoil uh, the holy life. 
But the beauty of, of being a part of a Sangha is that it's never about you. You're actually only teaching what you've learned from your teachers and because you've been authorized to do so by them. So it's like this beautiful chain that's just being passed down, you know, through lineages, through centuries, even through thousands of years. We have this incredible lineage. And for me, you know, when I first ordained, it was just so humbling and inspiring, first of all, quite a relief to get rid of this outer paraphernalia that made me look so different from everyone else and just become one of the pink nuns in Burma, you know, going along with other nuns, um, only measured, if you like, according to how long you've been ordained. That's the only thing differentiating you from any other nun. You all look the same. And you're all treated the same. You get the same food, the same requisites. It doesn't really matter how long you've been in robes. So it was very inspiring. And one of the first things I had to get used to was um, now I was a non. I still felt this enormous sense of reverence and respect to um, anyone who'd been in robes for so much longer than me. And of course, to my teacher, who was one of the most inspiring people I'd ever met. You know, it was uh, the first time I met somebody who I think had really taken significant steps on the path. And they radiated this aura of peace and tangible metta. This was my Sayadaw in Burma. I showed someone a photo of him recently and uh, she's not been meditating so long, but she just said, goodness, this, she was quite transfixed just by the photo, she said. There's, some, there's a deep peace there. It's like he's of this world, but sorry, in this world, but not of it. You know, there's something transcendent coming through. So this was one of the first times that I really got that impactful sense of what a Sangha, a true Arya Sangha really means, really is. Um, and it really did transform my practice. But at the same time, now that I was a nun, I was also um, quite embarrassingly at first being bowed to. And I remember the first time that some Burmese supporters came to the monastery, um, quite young women, and they didn't just sort of do the Anjali like this or even just bow on their knees. They actually got right down on the floor. <laughs> and I remember saying, oh, no, no, you know, don't do that sort of thing. Try and stand up. <laughs> and it took me a while to realise that actually this they weren't doing that because of me this was like a heartfelt um sign of their devotion and reverence not to me but to the robes and to what those robes represent yeah so it's greater than any one individual it's the representation of someone who lives a life of virtue because as monastics we should do that at the very least you know it's the representation the symbol of renunciation that they're paying respect to it was the potential for awakening in their own heart that they were paying respect to. You were a reminder, a symbol of that. And the Burmese people are deeply devotional and very committed to meditation. I mean, it was just incredible for me to spend those four or five years in that country where most people in the population just naturally keep the five precepts. And, you know, in our monastery on every, um, I think once a month, and also, of course, on moon days, on uh, Upasata days, people would come to the monastery. But even for the 10 day retreats, there would be groups of people queuing up to be ordained just for that retreat. And there'd be this sort of all this black hair on the steps of the uh, dining hall where Sayadur used to ordain them. There'd be all this like black hair sitting there outside. And I think, wow. And they just take the robes because that was the only chance they could find, but they couldn't miss a minute, you know, and then they'd sit for meditation for these 10 days, like rocks, you know, with their robes and everybody looking the same. And you felt it was really coming from the heart. So for me, it was a massive inspiration, but amazingly, the Burmese were even inspired by the Western monastics at that monastery. And there were only two of us at that time in the beginning. And they'd say, you know, gosh, if you can come all this way and leave your family behind, leave your jobs behind, you know, we've been to university, but we've left the potential for, you know, having a nice livelihood behind then, you know, maybe we don't really value what we have right here. So they would also feel it as a kind of callback to their tradition, to their roots and to, to the beautiful Dhamma that that country has preserved because the Burmese preserved 
all the texts, you know, they preserved it for generations and, um, and also the practices as well. So I had to get over that and actually put down my ego in that sense too. And it's the same when we receive offerings, you know. Um, I mean, right now I can't go on arms round with a bowl and I would actually, I would, I would try it in Oxford or wherever I am if it wasn't the coronavirus um, pandemic at, at the moment. But, um, you know, in Burma we did used to sometimes go. And what occurred to me with this is that you know, the Buddha says that the Sangha are a field of merit because you can make a lot of merit by offering to a good monk or a good nun. But at the same time, I, I feel that it's a field of merit because it's not just give and take. It's not that people give us something and we take their food. It's a give-give situation. You know, they're giving and by giving they're gaining and we're receiving and by receiving, we're also gaining, but then we're also giving the blessings. We're giving that sign of, you know, renunciation, the sign that yes, there is a, a path out of all suffering. And so it becomes this beautiful act of reciprocity, which really brings a lot of happiness to both parties and brings much more joy into this world. And I would like to think this has started happening with our little community too, you know, that we're um, sharing joy because I know that whenever I receive, you know, food offerings, I feel so touched, not just by the fact that I'm being fed, but by the kindness that that shows is in people's heart, by the understanding, you know, that it shows that people have towards the path because it's not again about only attaining and getting things for me it's about starting to notice that actually there's more happiness there's more peace when I give things up there's actually more joy and beauty to be found in giving and it's been proven scientifically now there's more joy in giving than receiving but of course the whole thing becomes one it's almost impossible to separate where the giving ends and the taking begins it's it's actually just give 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 and the whole thing is like this beautiful positive feedback loop, bringing more joy and happiness to all. So there was lots more I want to share. Um, I still have a bit of time. Uh, which part shall I tell you about? So I guess I want to talk a little bit about um, the importance of having a teacher or the beauty of having a teacher. Because for me, that's where the qualities of the Dhamma really come alive. As I said in the beginning, you know, with the Buddha, we can't actually sit and have a discussion with him because he's long since, you know, gone into the Parinibbana. But we can get a feeling of becoming closer to the Buddha through the texts, right? And the more we practice, the more our understanding grows through practice, our experience grows, the more those words will speak to where we're at. And sometimes you think, I've understood this particular thing that the Buddha is saying, but you go back to it a few years later and you see much deeper layers in what he said. You know, it's as if the whole thing just starts to open out, a bit like that lotus in the mind. The whole thing starts to reveal deeper subtleties, deeper layers, and more connections with the rest of the path. You know, so you start to be able to see how the whole path feeds in, each factor feeds into the next, and it all starts with right view. Yeah. So the right view is one of these things that the Sangha can really impart to us. And the right view is something that only the Aryas have. Yeah, As long as we haven't actually experienced Nibbana in the here and now, like the first experience of things ceasing, the body and the mind, and the sense that, you know, everything is conditioned, everything in this world is conditioned. It arises due to causes. When those causes pass away, that condition phenomena is no more. So they have right view about this. They have right view that it's a process. It's not about an individual. It's, you know, just this natural thing where you put certain causes in place and the results have to come. So they have this right view. And also, of course, they understand about how beings are born and die according to their karma, according to the actions that they've done in this life and in other lives. Um, but one of the right views is also that they have this unshakable faith, unshakable, unbreakable confidence in the Triple Gem and in the Buddha as the wisest teacher, you know, the one that we can really trust. 
And just to speak with Ajahn Brown sometimes in my interviews was so inspiring because he would sort of talk about his confidence being just so immense. You know, he actually said, it's sort of out of this world, you know, it's just so immense. And I could see his eyes just shining and gleaming and it was bringing me so much joy, so much pity, just to see, you know, the depth of confidence that we can really acquire, you know, that you know without doubt that this path leads to freedom. And I think, you know, being around a teacher like this also helps because they impart that confidence in you. So I can go to him and sort of say, like a few times I'd sort of say, yeah, the meditation's going well and I feel quite good. And But I don't know if, if I can really get all the way in this life because of my busyness, you know, maybe the momentum will be lost. And he said something really interesting to me. He actually said, that's not the momentum. The momentum is not coming from your effort or your will. It's not even coming from how much you practice in daily life, not entirely. He said the momentum is the momentum of renunciation and you've been ordained now for 14 years, you know. And then I remembered this sutta and I don't know where it is, but it's the simile of the stick. And the Buddha says that uh, there's four, three kinds of people, I think it is. And the first one is like a big wet log that you've just taken out of a river. It's really soaking wet, yeah. And it can't take the flame. It can't take, you know, it can't be ignited. You can't use it for firewood. Then the second person is like that big wet log that's been taken out of the river, but it's been left for a while to dry. So it's a bit further up the bank and it's maybe been out for a month or two, or in the case of practice, maybe it's been out for 10 years or so, right? Or maybe 20 years. And then the third log is like the log that you've taken out of the river and it's a long way from the river and it's been drying out, drying out, drying out for 10, 20, 30 years, maybe many lifetimes, yeah, maybe many. Um, and this is like the person who is, uh, this is obviously the firewood that can take the flame, but this is uh, the person who's been, who's renounced for a long, long time, who's renounced sensuality. So the simile was like, uh, the river is like the, the field of sensuality, the flood of sensuality. Yeah. And the log which is dry has been taken out of that flood of sensuality for a long, long time. And now it can take the, the heat and it can be used as firewood. So, you know, it's about just how long we're able to be out of that. And this starts, of course, with our precepts, avoiding coarse kinds of sensuality, especially the kinds which will harm others but gradually renouncing more and more and more of that sensuality to the point where we can even go beyond this sensual realm, you know, and enter things like jhanas, which are actually like entering a different realm. Yeah. And sometimes, of course, it may happen that people fluke these things at the beginning of their practice. And you think, wow, you know, now I've attained this jhana, I must be out of sensuality, or I must have seen non-self really deeply. But sometimes it's more like at that moment you have the momentum of letting go, but still the foundation needs building. Still you need to stay out of that river a lot longer and really dry out. You know, it's, it's very easy to be able to go back in again. Or even if craving comes in to be experience those things, you know, then then again, the whole thing's spoiled and you'll put a, a big obstacle in place for yourself because the sense of self has got involved, you know. At the time, you were able to let go of it momentarily, but then it came back in again. So this was really nice because he basically was telling me, you know, that he's not worried about me at all because and what I realized is it's not really about me, what he sees is always cause and effect. And he has such huge confidence in the path that he knows as long as you're taking steps, it has to lead a certain way. Yeah. The Satipatthana Sutta sometimes is talked about as, uh, the four Satipatthanas are talked about as the only path, the one and only path. But the real translation for that is actually the path which leads in one direction only, which is quite different, right? Otherwise we think, oh, the four Satipatthanas, that's the only meditation we need to do. And we focus on that factor of the path to the exclusion of all the other seven. But actually when you see that the Satipatthana is a path with one destination only, 
it shows that if we really do have right mindfulness, you know, and that right mindfulness is empowered by the preceding six factors of the path, then it, it is bound to lead to deep samadhi and from that deep samadhi to seeing things as they truly are. So it's a path with one destination only. And I can see that when I talk to Ajahn Brown, it's almost like, for example, if he tries to encourage me or, you know, um, point out certain qualities that I might have that I don't notice, he'll never say, oh, you are whatever. He'll always put it in terms of you're very committed or um, you're doing a lot of good. So... In other words, he's talking about qualities as verbs, not as objects, not as adjectives, right? It's not you are something, it's more that there is this thing, there is this way to practice, there are these qualities that you can develop. So there's never this sense of being fixed or being judged, even in a positive way, which is incredibly inspiring because nobody else relates to me quite like that. Right. Normally, if we're not already, you know, if we've not seen through a sense of self, we always relate to each other as um, sort of individuals with these personalities which are somewhat fixed. So such as such is kind, such as such is really nice. Whereas somebody who's seen through a sense of self will more see it in terms of how we behave. And I find that really inspiring and, and kind of quite notable, actually. And one of the things I think that really frees me up. Hmm. I don't want to talk too much more because I'm quite not familiar with talking actually after my month long. And also I want to give some time for some questions. Um, but I just wanted to really talk about um, the power, you know, of being able to tune up with the noble Sangha or even with anybody who's taken steps on the path because it's almost like we get swept along by them. You know? There are things in them that of course we can actually emulate and that we do start to emulate as soon as we um, notice the beauty of those qualities. It's almost natural that you'll start to notice those qualities in yourself as well, right? Because by seeing something beautiful in another, you're already saying that matters to me, that's important to me. You know, I can resonate with that. And, and just by that, just by that recognition, you're, you're actually much more likely to open up to the possibility of developing those things in yourself. And you're more likely to notice when they arise and to value them, to protect them, yeah, and to bring them to fulfillment. Because you know that they feel good, they feel right, and it feels like the path. Goenkaji, my first teacher, he used to say, like when you've just started practicing, it's like you've planted this little seed in the ground and it's definitely planted in fertile soil he used to say otherwise you wouldn't have come to the retreat and that already used to make me feel very inspired oh, maybe I've got fertile soil you know to receive the Dhamma teaching <laughs> and of course that's the same with all of you here you've all got very fertile conditions in your heart you know you're all ready for the Dhamma otherwise you wouldn't be here tonight you'd be at the pub or I don't know what else you'd be doing even if you're doing something very noble you know you still wouldn't be inclining your mind to the practice exclusively as you are so he used to say, you know, the seed has been planted in very fertile soil. There is no doubt, he'd say. Um, but now you have to be very careful so that the cattle will not come and eat it away. So he said, you have to put a fence around it. And that fence around the little seed is your virtue. So you put this virtue around the seed. And that seed, of course, is like your meditation or like your, your potential to develop the path. And... Um, also within that field, within that fence, is your daily practice. You also can see that as putting a fence around yourself in, in a sense that, you know, I take out this time for myself where I carve out that space, you know. I'm like in that bubble of practice for, I mean, he said from the beginning, two hours a day, and that's what I did since 96, you know, two hours a day, two hours a day without missing one. Ever? Maybe once or twice. I don't know, but it was really my commitment, you know. I remember at a point I was doing um, care work before I went to India for a Pali course because I had no money in those days. I was about 21, I think. Um, 
and maybe a bit older, 25 by then. I'd been in Asia several years by then and been practicing a while. So, but I ran out of my 20 dollars a week budget and had to come home and uh, did some care work while living with my mom. I remember I saved 500 pounds, which was enough to get to India and do the Pali year. <laughs> and uh, yeah, what was I saying that for? Ah! <laughs> uh, oh, that's right, because I was doing this care work and um, sometimes we had to do like 12 hour shifts and you know you'd be sort of working with people overnight and having to change them several times during the night i mean it was people with um in the last stages of dementia so really quite demanding challenging work and of course my time clock was all over the place but still i made this commitment that no matter what time of day or night it was i would sit these two hours no matter what and this is what caused the transformation you know this is what starts to really change your course, if you like. It's like the, the course starts, the direction of your life, the priorities start to change and you just will make sacrifices. You'll take the time out whenever you can, even if it involves perhaps missing on a job that could have brought you some more money. Or for example, when I did my degree, sometimes it meant every, every summer, it meant taking three months out and doing my three month retreat. You know, even though other students would have been swatting during those three months, I thought, no, this is my three months of practice because for the rest of the nine months, I have to study really hard. So we start to have confidence. We believe that, you know, if we put our energy in the direction of the Dhamma, the Dhamma will support us. And this is uh, really amazing that it actually does. Yeah. And Ajahn Brahm always says that in a Sangha, you know, we don't just support each other spiritually, we even support each other emotionally and physically as well. Yeah. So we look after each other, we look out for each other. And I hope that all of us here do too. So that was a bit all over the place, but I hope there was <laughs> something in there of benefit to you and of inspiration to you. And I just really encouraged, you know, cultivating this wise association because what I realized on my retreat is that even though most of the time I don't have a monastic, well, I don't have a monastic sangha at all, but I can associate with the wise even in my head, in my mind, in my heart, I can associate with spiritual friends. And of course, ultimately we become our own spiritual friend. Right? We become a Kalyanamitta to ourselves. So this is how we start to internalize those qualities and bring them within, connect with them, you know, mentally, connect with them through your heart. And bit by bit, you'll start to see them growing within you. So this is what I would like to offer for today. <laughs> sadu, sadu, sadu. <laughs> I feel like I'm really out of practice talking. <laughs> oh, it was so inspiring though. It was so inspiring to have my interviews this retreat. It was, I just had to share that. <laughs> Good. So we have time for some questions if you would like or some sharing or anything else that may be of benefit to you. So this is your space. Uh, please put your virtual raise hand sign up or if you're shy you can put it in the chat box and if I could just check with Mel that we're pinned to me perhaps otherwise yes good so whoever wants to ask it la out loud will be recorded voice only okay so if you don't want to have your voice you must ask it in the chat box okay Would one of the co hosties like to decide who to unmute and mention their name? I, uh, I've not got a question, but I just, it's just something that you said in the meditation, Benjamin Chandra. Yes. About sitting in the warmth and the light. And I just thought that was so amazingly beautiful because. Oh. I can say, you know, I knew you meant the light of uh, mindfulness and the warmth of loving kindness. But until then, it was always something I did 
rather than just sitting basking in it. Oh. So it was that was very wonderful. I, just, oh. I really wanted to share that because it was so beautiful. So oh, great. Oh, good, good, good. I'm glad that came through because I, I guess in that sense, that was my understanding too. Like, even with kindness and, and awareness, there are degrees of doing. Yeah. <laughs> and there's always this subtler level where we can just sit back that bit more, that bit more, that bit more. And I think when we really know how to sit back, that's when we disappear, you know. That's when the path it's, really yes, takes, it, takes it, over. It actually isn't ours, is it? But when we do it, we think it's ours. Yes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> oh, lovely. There's Niti, and I uh, want to ask a question. Hi. Hiya. Hi. Hiya. It's thank you so much. So lovely to see you. Um, it's probably, I don't know, it's brought, um, not sure if it's about what you talked about, probably is. Um, I, I know, um, I think I messaged you about my dad dying. And it was a few, it's, it was a few weeks ago. Interestingly, because I'd listened to Ajahn Brahm talk about death with such a lightness. I didn't, I was a bit disappointed I didn't experience that sort of feeling around. I, it was a bit strange. But what I wanted to ask you was, um, I know regret and guilt are a part of grief. Yeah. I've always known that, and when people have talked about that, I thought, oh, yeah, I get that, sort of, I, I, I would understand that. I don't understand why I'm feeling that when he's died. So he's mm. died, so he's not feeling my lack of action, because I couldn't go and see him because of COVID, you remember? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt incredibly guilty about that, but he's mm -hmm. not here. So why right. am I so free? Does that make any sense? Sure, sure, sure. Can you help? Yeah, I mean, you're right that it's natural. It's a natural part of, of grief. Um, I think we always look inside and wonder whether there's something more we could do. So that's also, you know, a natural part of it. But I also wonder if part of guilt, I mean, I don't know because I haven't lost anybody who I've then felt guilty about. Mm. Although there was one close friend who I felt slightly guilty about because the last time she asked to talk to me, I said I was too tired. And that was actually the last time. But I think what helps me is not to think of death as so final. Because if, that, if your dad has died and that's it, then the guilt will be increased because you'll feel like that's the end of my relationship with my dad. You know, there's nothing I can do now about it because he's gone but if you can still somehow connect with him or open your mind to the possibility that you might be able to connect with him even if he might not receive your communication you can still work through that you know you could write something to him for example or you could talk to him in your mind send him meta you know tell him the things that you might have wanted to say and I think this could be helpful I mean, it depends if that resonates for you, because obviously if that feels really strange that you don't believe he's there, um, then it won't work. But if you feel that he may be there somehow, there may still be that connection between your consciousness and his, then this could be helpful. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's a suggestion. Um, sometimes I talk to my friend and I tell her, you know, I love you and... It, it's a you know I was just tired that day and and once or twice I felt sort of guilty but I remember at the time I actually couldn't answer that question she wanted to ask so I do reason it with myself as well and, and I haven't really bought into the guilt um, but yeah I think over time you know as you learn more kindness and self-compassion those feelings just start to fade a little bit but don't try to fight it I mean it is natural and it's 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 okay you know, it's just passing through. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if that helps. Oh, 
I did want to talk actually. I, there was so much I always wanted to talk about, but another of the practices I did during this retreat was death contemplation. And imagining myself dying, I like to follow Ajahn Brahmali's um, guided meditation on that. He's got this particular one that I like and I play it many times. And it always has this beautiful effect of being able to sort of leave the grosser body and sort of start flowing out and start to get more of a sense of like the qualities in my heart at that time. And it's really beautiful with his prompting. You know, he talks about contentment and feeling gratitude for the way you've lived and for the people in your life and the sort of freedom and contentment that comes with knowing you've done your best and with now letting go letting go of the body and that you feel this overwhelming sense of peace come over you and it's really incredible because it does connect you more with the essence of your life you know and it, and it makes you realize that is what you take with you you know we have to drop this body we have to leave it behind and even the other day, Ajahn Brahm was talking about um, what's happening in Burma, you know, and how it's a very tragic situation. And I've lived in that country. So, you know, this is not a new thing, but very shocking because after 10 years of relative freedom, not full freedom, not full democracy by any means, they've gone back into this military dictatorship and, uh, you know, and young people are dying. But he was just reminding people that it's really, this is one body. And this is not to diminish the suffering or the reality of, you know, terrible grief and trauma those people are going through, but that, you know, dying with a pure heart, having not been the one to kill, having tried to do the right thing, you are still going to carry beautiful qualities into your next life. Mm -hmm. And in the end, this is what matters. This is what can really bring solace and, and meaning in those people's lives. Mm. Anyway, I do recommend that death contemplation. It can be quite, um, quite encouraging, I would say. Quite encouraging. Because you just drop all the little niggly things that you don't like about yourself or that you think you've done wrong. At the time of death, I mean, those are kind of really trivial. And you just contact this general sense of, okay, well, I've always had good intentions, you know. I've always done my best with the conditions at hand, with the knowledge at hand, with my, you know, my capacity at that time. And you'll find, yeah, actually, it can be quite a peaceful experience. Okay, any one more comment or, or question before we end? You're all very quiet. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Going, going, going. <laughs> so before we go, I had a few things to share. One is that we're going to start a Friday evening Sutta class. And I'm itching to get into it because for a long time I've wanted to talk about right view in a bit more depth. And uh, this book starts with that. So we're going to use this book to make it easy for me, out of compassion for myself, so that I can open it and we can go, oh, we can go uh, bit by bit through the book. So it's all words of the Buddha, but it's collected into various themes on social and communal harmony. And the first chapter is like right understanding, right view, then personal training, removing defilements, loving kindness, dealing with anger, proper speech, good friendship, uh, one's own good and the good of others, the intentional community, disputes. There's a lot. <laughs> so I calculate we can probably get about eight, was it, or 12, I forget. We can get quite a few sessions in before my rains retreat, maybe 12, but we'll draw it out in a bit of detail and we'll also have it more as a discussion. So I'll say a bit, I'll read a bit, say a bit, but then you can ask questions, discuss it along the way. So I invite everybody to come to the Friday night Sutta uh, discussion group. And if you can, if you wanna come regularly, I would recommend you getting a copy of this wonderful book. It's by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, social and communal harmony yes some my co-hosts are so great they've put Ajahn Vamali's death contemplation as well and also this book in there 
so yeah we will be putting a link uh in the next newsletter so but you can just google social and communal harmony bhikkhu bodhi well just even google bhikkhu bodhi it shows you all his books you know on amazon or another book publisher if you prefer to avoid the big bad amazon <laughs> so that's on fridays and what else was i oh there's a couple of day retreats that have probably just been opened up. So one is on patience and forgiveness with Bristol, uh, no, Brighton inside. But of course they're all online. So show up, it'll be just like a usual Zoom group with, with me. <laughs> so patience and forgiveness, Brighton Bodhi Tree. You can Google that as well. And beautifying the mind with London Insight. It's all the same subject. You just have to give it a different name. But yeah, patience and forgiveness. I thought that would be interesting because I can look more in more detail at what those sort of qualities really mean in our practice, in our meditation, how we can be patient with our mind. Uh, yeah, and there'll be lots of other things coming out as well in, uh, in the next newsletter. Good. So let's, uh, wow. Benny's amazing with these little Thingies, you put all the links in. My goodness. It's the younger generation. <laughs> okay, so let's unmute you and we can all wave goodbye.